Hi, I'm Lisa Savage. Welcome to Pathways to Progress. Your Portland City Councilors, Roberta Rodriguez and Victoria Pelletier. We're going to talk about municipal happenings this past month, and there have been a lot of them. Not all weather related, but gosh, aren't we having a lot of weather? That mm -hmm. probably makes your job a lot harder. Um, can we talk about the resolution for ceasefire in Gaza first? Would that be okay? Yeah. That's been weighing so heavily on me, uh, the genocide unfolding and... Um, can you talk a little bit about the process? I know Pius Ali brought, Councillor Pius Ali brought the resolution to you all. Mm -hmm. what, what was the, what was the process that went on? Yeah. You want me to start? Do you want to start? <laughs> so I'll, I'll start um, real quick. Yeah, so, you know, I guess foundationally, right? Resolutions are um, a, a vehicle that the council has available to them to express their position on an issue where they, we're probably not gonna have an actionable item on our agenda. So often, if there's something on the ballot and you know, we wanna kinda speak on it, we, this is the way that we do it. And we've used it in many different ways. Councilor Ali brought up this resolution calling for a ceasefire um, and also for a release of the hostages. Um, and it's, it's, it's been probably, since I've been in the council, the one resolution that has gotten the most people to show up and uh, to uh, provide public comment for it mm -hmm. and, uh, and to advocate for us to pass it. So it, it was, um, I think it was, it's interesting because often for these resolutions when they show up, like I said, they're not action items. So it's that, you know, it, they feel almost like um, inconsequential. Um, but this one really felt like the community got behind and, and it really had a, a really positive uh, impact on it. And, and I think, you know, obviously the, the, what we're asking for it and what we're asking of our leaders to, um, to call upon um, the Biden administration to, to, to get behind a ceasefire resolution. I think that it's, it's powerful and I think it, it was really meaningful. I'm, I'm proud that Council Ali did that and that we had the opportunity to go for it. And, and again, for the mm -hmm. community showing up like the way they did, that was, mm -hmm. that was powerful. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it was, it was a really powerful night. We had a, a lot of public comment, which was great, overwhelmingly supportive. But even prior to the meeting, we were getting a ton of emails of support of people asking us <clears throat> to support the resolution. Um, so I'm glad that we got to vote on it. I think there are only a handful of cities across the country that have actually gone forward with passing something that is calling for a ceasefire. And I read that I almost positive Portland is the only city in Maine right now that has put forward a resolution. Mm -hmm. And I don't know about New England, but I know that it's like a very, very small amount of city councils that have put forward port put forth something. Mm -hmm. um, so it was good to be a part of that. And I also think, you know, for this for some people that were you know, sending us emails. Uh, we had minimal comments, but some people were like, oh, like, what does Portland have to do with this? And like, why get involved? Um, and I, it was, I was glad that I was able to share how important our role is actually in conversations like this, especially, especially if they are not Portland centered, because people who come to city council, we're the closest to them in terms of elected officials. I think your city councils and your town councils, we are kind of the first tier of government. And so we're the closest to the constituents. And I think they were really asking for us to do something mm -hmm. and to really be able to advocate to our state and federal delegation. So I, f I feel like it was the least that we could do as, May as poor, um, Maine's largest city to actually you know, put put forth a resolution and support it, and it was unanimously supported, which felt really good. And it was also nice. I mean, I know technically people are not allowed to get excited in chambers, but after it passed, people were clapping and cheering, and they were very happy. And I think it was just a really nice moment of community. And again, I think us aligning ourselves with our goals of racial equity um, and being able to speak on what was happening and saying, like, again, this is a way that we can take a stand. Um, it's There's no action, as you said, behind it, but I think it, it's, it still meant a great deal to individuals in and out of Portland to just see that we did pass a resolution that we do stand um, you know, with the oppressed and with Palestine. I was a little surprised that it was unanimous. Mm -hmm. Was uh, Would I be right in thinking that there were a couple of amendments offered that uh, changed yeah. the original wording? Can you, can you walk me through that a little bit? Yeah, the amendments were, um, I think one was to write the release of hostages in the actual resolution, because I think originally, the original version didn't have releasing of hostages. Um, and then there was a second one, but I don't remember what it was. Um, it was I just like quick change in a sentence, I that think. That was the substantive change, was the, the adding the releasing okay. of the... Of but the, was there any mention of releasing the tens of thousands of uh, Palestinian prisoners that are being held that are basically the root cause of why Hamas mm -hmm. took hostages, saying, we want to trade you? Yeah. 
was yeah. there that didn't make it into that the was resolution. Not, no, that was not. Yeah. Thing. And even though the adding the and, and part of the reason why adding the views of the hostages was not in what it was why it was added and not not in the original one is because of right like yeah. the the on the endless amount of like arguments that would then need to be addressed. Mm -hmm. And so I think there was some some sort of um uh, I guess compromise to add that that sentence to it or to add that part to it, but understanding that you know it's not an all-inclusive call for for justice. That there's still a lot of things that are unanswered, a lot of injustices that are taking place. Um, but to pass the resolution, but you know, Council Ali felt that adding that uh, amendment was important. Yeah, the main coalition for Palestine has been really like growing and active, and I, I've joined it. But they just there's a lot of momentum there. I think tonight people are getting on a bus at midnight to go to Washington D.C. for the big march tomorrow. Oh, really? Yeah. Nice. Um, and uh, so it's been interesting. You know, of course, uh, to get a unanimous vote uh, yeah. is, you know, what well, that surprised me. Uh, but uh, some of the people in the coalition were like, what about the Palestinian prisoners, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but, you know, it's impossible to, to do it perfectly. One of the things that I've really been realizing from being in this uh, relationship that we have doing the show together for almost two years now is what a, an important function of the city council it is to allow the public to express their uh, will. You know, your meetings, uh, sometimes they go until gosh, way, way into the wee hours of the morning yeah. sometimes. But there really isn't another mechanism. Like what else is there? Letters to the editor. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, if you happen to see us on the street, we might interview you. Um, so it's a, actually a pretty important function of city council. And I'm sure there must be meetings where you're sitting there thinking, oh my God, <laughs> we've heard the same. You know, I've made people say the same thing over and over a lot. Yeah, I, well, I think, I mean, it's so interesting because the longest uh, period of time we had public comment, I think, was Order 68, so. and it was four hours of public comment. Mm -hmm. And so I think the with the pro, with the um, Palestinian resolution, I don't know, it was maybe an hour and a half. I don't know. I don't really remember, but it was significant. But even... I don't know. It's something about being in person. And even though it seems like everybody is maybe saying something similar, I think everyone comes with different energy. Everybody comes with a different story. And so it actually is really easy, at least for me, to stay really engaged with what people are saying. One, because I think it is our duty to you know, pay people respect when they're coming to the meeting and they're sharing. They're waiting to give comment sometimes for hours. Mm -hmm. I really want to make sure because I've been to meetings before where they're not the you know former mm -hmm. counselors um, and former elected officials sure. have haven't been, yeah, like just haven't been, you know, paying respect and haven't been like, thank you for coming in and trying to look and make eye contact. It mm -hmm. definitely is challenging at times when you do have to endure and can kind of sit there for hours. But I think that's the least that we can do as, as elected officials. Mm -hmm. And I think for especially for the um, the resolution, it was I, I it was hard because everybody was really emotional and hearing, of course, the the horrific things that have been happening to Palestinians. It was a really emotionally charged meeting, but it was also really necessary for us to hear that. Like, I didn't want us to, I didn't want any sugarcoating on the realities of what was happening. And so mm -hmm. people were there and they were sharing extremely graphic stories. And that was the, that's the reality of what's happening. Mm -hmm. So I think, again, as individuals that are super privileged to be in that room and are not, you know, currently in the midst of a genocide, I think it was really important for us to make sure that we were hearing everybody, allow them to share, and even. You know, I know there was some challenges with people getting emotional and kind of like speaking and cheering or booing or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and even that is really it's hard because you're in a space and you're um, you have emotions and especially with such a significant topic. Mm. Um, you know, I I definitely was hoping that we there were a couple times we paused and I wasn't sure if we were going to go forward or not, because I know Mayor Diane was getting getting a little bit upset at people speaking and, and just kind of like, you know, sharing their, their feelings via sharing, booing, whatever. But I think in those moments, I, I think we need to be as lenient as possible and understand that people are coming in and they're, you know, they're coming in to share their, their stories and they're coming in to share their experiences. And so I think we can respect that and also understand that it's going to be an emotional time in there. Yeah, you know. the, that night was it was really interesting because it, it we did have significant amount of public comment, yeah. but it, it wasn't the longest that we've always had, that we've ever had. Mm -hmm. But it, but it, it was so the energy was so heightened mm -hmm. that night yeah. that it, it it I was I was engaged and I was listening to all the public comments yeah. and it was 
Like the, I mean, I, I don't want to say it was tiring, but I did feel at the end of the night, I leaned over to Council of Fairness and I said like, wow, it's, it's only 7.30. I feel mm -hmm. like we've been here for much longer yeah. than that. Because it felt, it felt intense. Um, you know, public comment, I've, I've been, I would say fortunate to have been part of probably over the last several years, some of the longest meetings that we've had. Mm -hmm. So the reopening of the schools after the, the shutdown of the pandemics, when we were deciding our health and safety protocols, those meetings went on well past one, two in the morning also. Mm -hmm. And at one point, we ended up having to stop a meeting and start over the next day. So we're talking school board now. School board, your, yeah. Your and then when we had the SRO uh, mm -hmm. removal mm -hmm. from, from the schools, that was also a very long meeting mm -hmm. because of public comment. Mm -hmm. And then Order 68 yeah. um, to, to stop the, the camping policy, obviously, mm -hmm. you know, a couple of meetings ago. That was a very, so I've been part of, I think some of the largest showings of public comments. So you're kind of a ball. controversy magnet, is what you you're saying. You know what? I've, I've, if there's something <laughs> that I'm going to take away from my years in public, it is those moments. But, mm -hmm. but to your point, you know, public comment. Those in those instances where it's been like literally hours of, of people speaking, I've been. That's when I've been the most engaged. Right. That's when I. I mean, I was chair of the board during the, the other two, so I, I was literally the one that was in charge of like <clears throat> introducing people and getting them out of the queue. And then for 68, it was I, I and Councilor Trevorrow, Councilor Trevorrow and myself, um, introduced it. So I was, I felt like this duty, like I have to listen to everybody. Even, and there were a lot of people that were opposed to it, mm. but you know, especially those people. Yeah. And um, I've learned to, to really appreciate it. I've learned to appreciate that people show up for the issues that they care for, and there isn't any one global issue that's going to get them all out there. So over the span of like you know, some eight years that I've been around doing this, mm -hmm. I've seen different people show up for different things, and, and I think it's always been really special. Mm -hmm. Is this an appropriate time to reflect on the change of not taking Zoom comments anymore? Ooh, yeah. Because obviously that was a whole different yeah. structure with its own set of problems, and yeah. have you now had <clears throat> two meetings or More three meetings? Thing. Yeah, we've had uh, we've had uh, several since we we stopped taking Zoom comments. I think in was it the end of summertime. Yeah, around maybe? October. I think okay. it was. <coughs> Excuse me. So, so it's been several meetings now of, of having them in person, and it, you know it, there is always kind of a double edged sword to it because of course I people want to be able to cook dinner or take care of their children um, or even be at work but engage in the meeting and be able to call in. So that was the great part about Zoom was that you know if the meeting is seven, eight, nine o'clock and you can't make it to City Hall, you can call in and still make your voice heard. But I mean, we you know we were getting. It was it was horrible and it was un we couldn't endure it anymore. I couldn't endure it anymore. So I think now that we are only having meetings where you can give public comment in person, um, people are are showing up pretty significantly, which is I think really good because I think for a while coming into City Hall we were getting the same group of individuals that are coming into every meeting and they still mm -hmm. are. Mm -hmm. But I think now we are seeing a wider range of people coming in because they know that that's the only option is yeah. to give public comment in person. So it's not like Portland's huge geographically. So yeah. they're not right. people don't have to come super, super far. Right. It's the parking, really. I mean, how, how long did you drive around tonight? Oh, for yeah. Parking in yeah. There? A long time. And I think like I love when we have a meeting and there's a bunch of people in there because I'm like, OK, mm -hmm. we're getting into the energy. Something. Yeah, there's energy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's not four people. It's packed on the bottom and on the top. <laughs> and I, I actually really love that because it shows everybody is here. It's Monday night and everybody's really engaged. And I think that that says something about getting involved in, in local politics. And I've always loved that. So whether it's good or bad or I get my way or I don't, I love seeing a packed um, council chamber. I think it looks really good. I agree. It was interesting to me because, again, in the coalition, uh, the main coalition for Palestine, there was a little bit of uh, first they said, oh, you can Zoom comment. And then somebody said, no, mm. you can't. They don't take Zoom comments anymore. Uh, well, why not? That's ableist. And somebody said, well, it is. But they were, you know, g g they were getting Zoom bombed like right. constantly. And so then people were like, OK, OK, we, you know, we understand that. But it's a trade off. It is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's tough. It's, it's like, off. you know, do we want to because we, we were hearing horrific racial slurs. Yeah. But then it's also like we want people to be able to to give their comment and not have to come in. So mm -hmm. I don't know if we'll revisit it or not. I assume we will probably talk about it because we have a new council, you know, some mm -hmm. new members. I'm sure, sure we'll talk about it again and just see what works and what doesn't. But I think for right now, we haven't really gotten anyone saying you need to go back to having it only on, or we, you need to go back to having it hybrid. We mm -hmm. haven't really gotten that feedback. 
yeah. very much. Yeah. So. I don't think. Yeah, I don't think I've heard um, that either. Yeah. Um, I. I mean, I. To, to be very honest, I. Pers I'm kind of torn, but I. I think I'm much more open to us going back to allowing um, remote participation. I. I do think that we need to put in place some systems that that yeah. maybe you know help to mitigate some of the, the the hate speech that we were that we were being you know. Uh, confronted with, and perhaps screening the calls, right? Like, just simply, like, sure. you can tell, I mean, we know from the moment oh, that yeah. they introduce themselves, you can <laughs> tell whether there's a clown behind the microphone or, like, an actual resident. Mm -hmm. And so screening them, hey, can you tell me your name and, and your resident, and we'll put you in the queue. Mm -hmm. And that yeah. and that can probably help, you know, mm -hmm. to mitigate some of that. But I, I do think that it's a valuable tool for people to contact us. I'm, I, my wife and, and neighbor, they're, you know, when they watch the meetings, they're like, you know, with their headphones on, so they're like doing stuff around the house yeah. or like running errands and they're like being able to do, multitask. You know, you can't sit in a council meeting and watch us do it and cook dinner for your family. Right. You know, like that, that just doesn't work. So yeah. having the availability to be, uh, to access remote public comment, I think is really important. So if there's a way that we can get there, I, I would, I'd like us to explore it. Mm, okay, that's good to know. Well, no show would be complete without us talking about our unhoused uh, neighbors <clears throat> and friends. Um, obviously there was a big sweep since we've had our last meeting of the Harbor View and also the- Douglas Field. Douglas Field encampments um, and uh, what do you want to share about you know I know that the um, council didn't want to have sweeps at all and they didn't want to have sweeps in winter but lo and behold we've had a sweep I saw a TV segment I don't know how accurate it was uh, just recently last couple days showing the the new shelter and saying like gee uh, they had somebody from Preble Street saying, you know, that I think everybody's in shelter today. I mean, you can only say it for mm -hmm. a day. But um, in some sense, it, it seems that perhaps in conjunction with the weather, uh, that it was effective in getting people into a, a safer <coughs> roof over their head, not going to freeze to death mm -hmm. uh, situation. Um, how are you guys feeling about this most recent sweep? or sweeps, I should say, it was really two locations, yeah. right? Yeah, I mean, it's, I was glad that we uh, postponed it even a little because mm -hmm. it, I got feedback directly from outreach workers and individuals working at Preble Street that even, you know, an, a couple extra days actually really helped them get more individuals into shelter. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so I think, you know, I was glad that we, we're able to postpone it. I'm obviously, you know, Councillor Trevorrow and I wrote an op-ed about how we feel about encampment sweeps. And I think it's, I, you know, I, I'm really looking forward to us doing work in health and human services and public safety to really address a lot of the barriers that we're still getting feedback on that exist at the HSC. I think I'm just like ready. I really want people I want us to treat the unhoused like people, and it's really hard because I think we have a ton of feedback where we are treating them like animals, essentially, and saying, like, just sweep them right into the shelter. You've seen that that doesn't work. It hasn't worked since May. Um, yes, it's getting colder, so now we are seeing more individuals who have no other options going into the shelter. Mm -hmm. But it's been really, it's been a frustrating kind of back and forth, and we've been talking about this now for a while, on... Um, the ultimate result of sweeping encampments, which I still don't think results in mass movement to shelter. We've seen that it doesn't result in mass movement to shelter. If it is absolutely freezing out and our shelters are still empty, mm -hmm. then we that we have a significant issue. There were individuals through the warming uh, center that was open when we had that storm the other night that didn't want to go inside the warming center and instead we're setting up, I and this is, Again, something that I saw on social media that we're like setting up outside of the warming center. And advocates that were working at the warming center who have experience working with the unhoused, we're not forcing them to come in, just going on, checking on them, making sure they were okay and saying, you don't have to come in. I think we, we have this assumption that people aren't traumatized by certain areas that they're not familiar with. We have assumptions that like any type of building will do for someone that's unhoused of just going right in and not realizing that a lot of people with have lived experience of being unhoused just because they see something that is a shelter doesn't mean that it's a place where it's like, oh, thank God, I can't wait to go in there. I think we're looking at it from the perspective of people that aren't um, aren't unhoused. And I think with the HSC specifically, I really want to make sure that we're looking at like, why aren't 
individuals wanting to come in here? And how do we make sure that we're having those conversations and making this as barrier free as possible? And also understanding that we can't force people into the shelter. And if we're sweeping their encampments in the hopes to force them into shelter, then we're criminalizing them for being unhoused. I don't see any other way around it. I don't know how else to talk about it. I know people are, you know, like we rewrote our op-ed, we got some op-ed responses back, which I love, that's part of how it goes. I have my opinion, you people have theirs. But I'm never gonna criminalize anyone for being unhoused. And I think that that's been a really challenging back and forth with a lot of people of saying, well, we're your constituents and they're breaking the law. And it's, you know, there, we, we have a significant systemic issue that I think is so clear. And we made our goal racial equity again, second year in a row. So, you know, I'm hopeful that we can come up with better solutions rather than just thinking that we can continue to sweep and force people into a place that they don't feel comfortable or safe. I also feel like I need to say shelter isn't housing. Right. Yeah. It's a short-term solution. <laughs> it might keep somebody from freezing to death, but it's not housing. Right. And it, yeah. Yeah, it's it's interesting that when people when when the calls go for, oh, we gotta get these people in the shelters, I I think that they assume that it's like that's the end result, that they should stay there. Mm. I was like, no, that is like literally like barely a means to an end to some of them. Mm. Um, I agree with, with what Tori was saying. I think that when we, when we when we approach homelessness with with a caring and inhumane approach, um, I think that we can achieve so much more, right? Because we start to deal with the humanity and that shared humanity that that we want community to to deal with problem solving. Um, I, I I I think that the effort that we saw our partners put in place when they had that extra time when the when the sweat, when the sweep was postponed was incredible. I got an email today from Preble Street mm -hmm. that talked about the number of people that they were able to get housed and, and the outreach, the, the the ex, you know, the outreach effort that they put out there and it's it's amazing. Mm -hmm. And and if yeah. those people and that effort is what drives policy making, I, I feel optimistic about what we can achieve. Now to your question about how I feel about the sweep, what what is most frustrating to me and what I keep saying during our meetings and what I was trying to to accomplish with Order 68 is that we need to understand how these decisions are made. You know, when, when we talk about the number of available beds in the shelter being um, you know, we saw a, de a decrease in the number of intakes at the shelter, and so we felt the sweep was indicated. That means nothing to me because I don't know what the benchmark was. What was mm -hmm. the threshold that wasn't met? <clears throat> how many people? How many? I don't mean none of that stuff is clear to me. Mm -hmm. But the decision is still made. So I, I feel as a counselor helpless because mm -hmm. my job is to, to be right like the messenger from the constituents. To, to, to the manager, I'm supposed to be able to communicate back and forth. My constituents are saying this, hey, the, the information that I'm getting from the staff is that. But I, I can't do that right now because I don't understand the process by which that sweeping policy or the encampment sweeps are taking place. And I've been, I don't know how else to get this across. Now, thankfully, <laughs> as a result of Order 68 failing, and it got it got pushed over to the Health and Human Services Committee, and that's where that work is going to start taking place. We had our first. And you guys meeting. are both on that. Committee. We're both on that meeting, along with Councilor Fer Councilor Fernier and Councilor Trevorrow, and that we just had our first meeting, and um and there's there's some exciting work that is going to take place. But again, to me, the priority needs to be a clear understanding across all stakeholders of how the data is used to then use that policy. If we're going to continue to have a policy that allows the manager to to sweep encampments, mm -hmm. so. That, that to me is so, so important. Well, maybe I've just been making this wrong assumption that the way the decision is made is that influential constituents contact, uh, not the council necessarily, but city government officials, you know, people that work for the city, complaining, get this, get this encampment out of my neighborhood. You know, we have this problem, we have that problem, we have this complaint, we have that complaint. There's always a, a, a big issue of public health because public health affects not only the people in the tents, but the people in the neighborhood and so forth. And I haven't, I mean, again, it's just my assumption that there isn't really a metric. It's more like pressure builds up saying, city, you must do something. And mm -hmm. then, you know, <clears throat> but there, you know at, act. there are, there is a percentage of the population that's going to require a different approach than the, the the vast majority of their own house population, right? And uh, an approach in how you get them, you know, the how the proper housing um, situation for them. And guess what? The folks that are once we get the vast majority of people into a shelter, the ones that are still out there are the ones that need more help, right? The ones that need more time, more effort, different approaches. Maybe a different team needs to go out there. What they don't need is to be swept out to another part of town to start over the work. They need more emphasis, more 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 attention. And I don't, I don't understand how 
anyone can come to the conclusion that sweeping an encampment is the best way to help the people that are most dire need of our, of our resources. It's, it's the opposite of what I think yeah. most people would conclude is, is indicative to help those people. I don't, that's just my sense. Well, isn't part yeah. of the controversy been that somebody, I think it was Councillor Trevoro said, these are, you know, I consider the unhoused uh, folks my constituents too, and there was a huge outburst <laughs> of, what do you mean they're your constituents? Well, of course they're your constituents. Yeah, I think that told us everything we need to know yeah. about the, the viewpoint that some individuals have about the unhoused is like, they're not, your constituents, I'm your constituent. And the, the reality is, you know, we, you know, we, they are all of our constituents. We want everybody in Portland to be able to have a safe place to access shelter, a safe place to, I mean, you know, the top thing would be everybody has their own place, is warm, is safe. And, you know, of course we don't want anybody outside. I think that's also such a common misconception with like supporting Order 68 and being anti-encampment sweeps. Everyone's like, oh, so you just, you want everybody outside. Of course, I, you know, right. it's That was out. the framing to make it yeah. sound like you guys wanted people camping. Yeah, and we, can't, and we can't leave them outside. Like we need to help them, we can't leave them outside. Mm -hmm. But the reality is, and we've said this a million times, if every shelter we had was full, there were still gonna be individuals camping outside. That's just the reality. So I think, you know, it's it's gonna take significant time as well. And I think that that's something that I try and make sure everybody is aware of. This is, I think we're seeing now the growth of encampments in such a significant way, more than we ever have before. It's not gonna be something that we're ever going to be rid of one and two i think even the current encampments that we have it's going to take time it's going to take time for us to figure out our housing crisis in portland it's going to take time for our social service workers to build up relationships and trust with individuals who have been let down by the system and don't trust in any individual saying hey come to this shelter come to this place and, and you'll be safe had very traumatic childhood exactly very yeah. very severe yeah. trauma experienced in the past yeah so yeah coercion and force and violence are not yeah. helpful to yeah. someone who's living with that kind of trauma. Mm -hmm. um, yep. it's, a, it's a tricky situation, but. Um, so you have a meeting coming up uh, with the committee. Do you wanna talk, we have a couple minutes left. Do you wanna mm -hmm. give us a little uh, teaser of what? Um, our, what the Health and Human about? Services? Yeah, we just, we had our meeting on tu Tuesday. I'm like, what day is it? We had it on Tuesday. <laughs> And it was great. It was our first meeting of the of the year, of the session. Now Councillor Rodriguez is on the committee with us, which is great. We have four councillors now. Um, we talked about goal setting, about what we want to do, what we want to accomplish, of course, encampments and our unhoused was at the top of the list. I think um, Councillor Fournier is in the process of organizing another kind of listening session, similar to what we had in June, where we will be at Ocean Gateway or wherever mm -hmm. with social service staff, city staff. Um, people from around the area, business owners, District 5 residents, of hopefully unhoused advocates as well. And then we're gonna just be able to listen to feedback. My hope is that in that session, we have a lot more feedback from the unhoused community because the first one, we really didn't. Um, it was really residents who are housed kind of talking about how they feel about the unhoused. So I'm hopeful that this can be maybe more of an unhoused um, centered conversation so that we can see what we need to do better in order to to help support but I'm excited for us to to really prioritize that work on, on top of a million other things this year but um, you know we're, we're looking forward to really finding ways that we can make sure that we're advocating for our unhoused and supporting the work of the encampment crisis response team and, and city staff as well I'm um, yeah I'm also excited where there's gonna be a new uh, health and human services uh, department head or director mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so having that person come in again or come in and, and get caught up with the work and be a new leader in that department I think it's going to be um, crucial how the committee operates with a new director in place mm -hmm. um, yeah I'm, I'm excited for the for the being in the committee this year I've been trying to get in this committee for two years and um, <laughs> I mean it's not like I wasn't allowed to but I, I, I just didn't it didn't line up for for me to be in it so finally this year I am um, I they made you in you got, oh, in, with the made, cool got in no I made the choice I actually I decided to step out of um, sustainability and transportation mm -hmm. um, which I had been in the last few years and I said no I, I really want to follow the, this last year mm -hmm. of my first term I really want to follow the encampment and and the homelessness um, issue more directly and that committee is what, what allows me to do it so um, uh, mayor that mayor Diane was uh, was able to get me in there yeah. 
Can I say one quick thing? We're out of time. Can I say one quick thing? It's got to be quick. Jim Levine from Homeless Voices of of uh, of, of Homeless Ju Justice <laughs> Voices for Justice. Um, he's in the hospital. He was in an accident oh. a couple of weeks ago. Oh, so just want a big shout out. I hear he's doing better. Big oh, shout out to him. Oh, you know, we love you, Jim. Yeah, we love you, Jim, so much. And I'm um, sending him all the best wishes and that he gets better, better oh, uh, soon. Yes, he's been a very important voice in that community for yeah, many years. Absolutely. And, yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks for being with us, audience at home. Thank you so much, Portland Media Center and our tech crew. Couldn't do it without you. Thank you, counselors. Uh, we are here every second Friday of the month at 7 p.m., coming to you live. Uh, you can hear us as a podcast on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, and also um, on YouTube. Now we live stream on YouTube, so uh, the show is available as a recording almost immediately after we're finished. So please join us next time. We have a little surprise in store for you. And uh, in the meantime, stay warm, stay dry, and be well. <laughs>